What's the difference between a big miracle and a small miracle? Now, a big miracle you might define, as we say in the Tanakh, an example might be the splitting of the Sea of Reeds in which the water suddenly retreats as the Egyptians are coming closer and closer. And for an individual, a big miracle might mean the birth of a child or healing from a terrible diagnosis. But a small miracle, I think that's harder to define. Maybe a small miracle is when a teacher looks at a student and suddenly they have that light bulb moment. Or maybe it's when you walk through a door and you see someone and you say to yourself, I think that's my Beshert. I think that's the one I'm going to marry. The Shulchan Aruch, our code of Jewish law, offers a conversation about supernatural miracles impacting more than one person and also speaks about miracles where just one life is saved. But no matter what, our Jewish law guides us towards reciting a version of the following blessing whenever a miracle takes place. She'asali nes bamakom hazeh. Thank you, God, for the miracle that has happened in this very place. Now, I bring up this halachic, this discussion in Jewish law, because in our parsha this morning, in Parshat Pinchas, the commentators offer an astounding insight on Pinchas's character. You see, at the beginning of the Parsha, we are revealed into an environment in which a plague has broken out. And what we're told is that Pinchas and Moses and the Israelite nation, well, they witness what you might say is questionable behavior between an Israelite man and a Midianite woman. Now, it all seems very public. And so Pinchas, and we can talk about this at another time, whether or not we agree with his actions, but he takes matters into his own hands, and he decides to kill the two. But then all of a sudden, the plague stops. And so it seems as if Pinchas's actions, because of him, the plague ceases, and because of that, Pinchas is awarded something very interesting, a brit shalom, a covenant of peace. And now suddenly, according to the commentators, according to Yalkut Shimoni, a midrashic compilation, this all makes sense. Because here we have Pinchas, a covenant of peace. Aha. Pinchas must be an undercover Elijah a hidden Elijah the prophet. Because just as we can see Pinchas making peace between Israel and God, what does Elijah do? We're told in the world to come, Elijah the prophet will make peace between God and his children. Now remember, in our tradition, Elijah heralds the coming of Mashiach, the coming of a time of peace. But throughout Jewish lore, we are told that when humanity experiences times of turmoil, times of distress or anguish, it's Elijah, usually Elijah hidden in another form that comes to that very moment and offers vision, that offers compassion, that offers comfort. It's Elijah who offers us a glimpse of olam haba and olam hazeh, if you will, a glimpse of heaven on earth. In our tradition, you will hear about Elijah figures when some kind of miracle takes place, and in the Parsha, Pinchas stops the plague. You have to ask yourself the question, is that not miraculous? Is that not wondrous? And then according to the Midrash, of course, here we go. Pinchas, Elijah, this is something only a miracle maker can do. But what I want us to consider this morning is that I think there are very few times in our lifetime in which each one of us can say with conviction and certainty, you know what? Today I met Elijah. 
How many times do you go home at the end of your day and you say, you know, I really met someone today who is a miracle maker. Now we know they exist all around us. The ones who save lives, the one who stop wars, the people that somehow change this world in ways we can only imagine, but do we really take the time to name them? We're busy, we're distracted, but the Baal Shem Tov tells us that the world is filled with miracles and wonders, but humanity, humanity doesn't see them. And so because of that, instead of searching for Elijah, instead of searching for someone else that will stop the plague or stop the war or change the world, I am going to challenge us in a different way this morning. How do we, how do we train how do we train our hearts and souls to create moments of Elijah, to create echoes of Elijah, seeing ourselves as the ones that daily can break the boundaries of time and space and reveal a glimpse of what redemption can be? Now, an Elijah moment, take that phrase, an Elijah moment, it may not always be saving someone from a burning building, which of course is miraculous. An Elijah moment might be something smaller, but it can be something just as transformative, just as life-altering, just as extraordinary. In his book, The Uses of Tradition, Rabbi Jack Wertheimer shares the following example, a story that I call an Elijah moment. Now, the story is told of novelist Franz Kafka. And in the story, it's a time in his life in which he is very ill. And in the last time that he visits Berlin, he stumbles upon a little girl in the park. And the little girl is sobbing beyond belief. And so Kafka goes up to the little girl and says, what's wrong? And she continues to cry and she weeps and she says to Kafka, I'm crying because I lost my doll. But somehow with an open heart, Kafka challenges her and says, you know what? That's not true. Kafka says, you know what? The, girl, the doll isn't lost. Do you know what? The doll actually went on a trip. And when the doll left, I met the doll as soon as she was about to leave. And Kafka said to that little girl, you know what, if you promise to return to the park tomorrow, I'm going to bring you a letter directly from the doll to you. And so for the next several weeks, Kafka arrived every morning to that very park to that little girl with a letter for his brand new friend. Now, like I said, Kafka was ill. And so he knew it was time to return to Prague, but not before buying the girl, a brand new doll. But along with the new doll came a letter in which Kafka insisted that this was the very doll, the exact same doll that belonged to his friend. And she said, of course it isn't. That's not my doll. And he said, no, your doll has returned. You know what? Your doll looks a little different. But you know what? When you go on a really long trip, Everyone sees remarkable sights and everyone goes through so many experiences. Your doll has changed. Life has changed her. And the little girl nodded and understood. And so in giving that little girl the letters and the doll and of course his precious time and his open heart, Kafka changed the little girl, giving her a reason in that moment to hope again. In other words, <laughs> It was an Elijah moment. Now that might be a small moment in someone else's eyes. We might nod our heads and smile and say that was a really cute, precious story. But in the eyes of that little girl, can you imagine? This was an unforgettable, life-altering experience where an adult looked at a child and said, here's hope again. You know, I think if we let them, those little moments, the Elijah moments, those can be the most formative. Maybe it's offering someone a seat in shul next to you 
a seat in synagogue next to you, someone who usually sits alone and saying to them, I'd like you to sit next to me this Shabbat. Maybe it's calling up a loved one and letting them know, you know what, I just need you to know, I see more in you than you can see in yourself. Maybe it's noticing an undervalued coworker, or maybe it's taking a walk and looking at the strangers that we probably see every single day and asking ourselves, why am I put on this earth? Why am I put on this path to be with these people? What is it that I can say or I can do in order to bring the power of Elijah into our lifetimes? A student went to the Baal Shem Tov one morning and said, Rebbe, I want to see Elijah. And the Baal Shem Tov said, okay, if you want to see Elijah, you need to do exactly what I say. So the Rebbe said, take a bag and fill it up with clothing and food, and I want you to go to the most torn down home on the edge of the forest, and what I want you to do is put your ear up to the door. Don't knock yet, but listen. And only after listening, then I want you to knock on the door and ask if you can stay the night. So the student went, he found this exact home, he put his ear to the door and he started to listen. And he could hear children crying. Mommy, I'm so hungry. Father, I don't know if I can wear these clothes again. They're so torn. I don't know what we're going to do for Shabbat. And the mother answered, don't you worry. I know Elijah the prophet will bring you everything you need. And the student knocked and said, you know what, I couldn't help. But over here, I have food for you and I have clothing. I have everything you need. And of course, the family was happy and the student stayed the night. And he went back to the Baal Shem Tov and said, you lied to me. I didn't meet Elijah. I have no idea what you're talking about. And the rabbi said, okay, I think you're right. So you know what, go back and do it again. So the student went back, he filled his bag full of food and clothing, everything you can imagine, and he put his ear exactly to the door one more time, and he heard the children. Mommy, we're hungry. I don't know what we're going to eat tonight. What are we going to do? And the mother responded, didn't Elijah come last Shabbat and bring you food and clothing? Elijah stayed with us for two whole days. I promise you that Elijah will come soon and bring you everything you need. And now the student understood. And he knocked on the door. The Talmud teaches that no miracle worker is aware of his own miracle. So we may not be aware of the miracles we perform for others, nor may we ever deem our own actions as miraculous, but for someone else, for someone else, you just might hold the power of redemption in your hands and bring it just a little bit closer. So moments of Elijah, big or small or in between, I hope that we all listen closely because I think someone is waiting just for you, just for you to knock on their very door. So please, don't wait because I truly believe redemption depends on you. Shabbat Shalom. We continue in our Shabbat morning service with Ein Kelohenu, page 204. <laughs> 